is our next to the last presentation, and we're so happy to have a nice crowd. Um, I've got a very special speaker tonight, all the way from Maryland. Um, I want to tell you about next week, while well, I've got your attention, next week, Nevis Leary from Rover. Um, he's going to talk about the ironclads and the um, Ronit Rover and the airball sound and how that affected us right here in Edenton. He actually um, is a team member on the replica that was built up uh, the Roanoke just above um, Plymouth. And Plymouth played a very major role in the Civil War. Um, this week I have Gerald Thomas. Uh, Gerald and I attended um, about 12 years of school over in Burt T together. You went to school. <laughs> I learned for <full> baseball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, since he left Bertie County, he resides in Laurel, Maryland, with his wife. Um, he served as a federal executive. He was a congressional auditor, and he's written all these books. I'm real proud of him, and I've got several copies myself. He's written about the Civil War. He's currently writing a book about World War II. Um, he's written many, many acclaimed articles, and he's extremely knowledgeable, and we're very, very lucky to have him tonight. And then, just want to make sure everybody knows our new librarian, um, head librarian, um, Jared, um, I gotta say it, Jack of all. Jack of all, you got it. <laughs> I, I think I've always had a little dyslexia, um, not diagnosed, but uh, sometimes I struggle with big words. Um, and just want to make you feel welcome and encouraged to be here. And I can't thank you enough. Gerald, you, Jared, do you have a couple of words? Yeah, well, I wanted to say thank you everybody for coming today. We have had a great uh, armchair traveler series thus far. Um, and I am just so excited by all the turnout we've had in the past, uh, past, few, past five weeks or so. Um, and I'm excited to see all this history, all this local... Uh, local knowledge that was just hidden right beneath our feet here today and um, I'm happy to be here as uh, part of the library serving you guys and working with you in the community um, and today I'm excited to hear more about the naval history um, and our little area of the Ibomar Sound and how that shaped up in the Civil War during the time during the time and you know it's easy and I was talking with Mr. Thomas over here that it's easy to look at the maps and all of these textbooks and learn about just, you know, how, just the broad strokes of history. But it's another thing to really get into the nitty gritty and learn about what, what made stuff happen. What was the logistics involved? What were the motivations and what was the difference between success and what was the difference between failure and why things happened the way they did. And I'm excited to hear from Mr. Thomas as he tells us about the Abomarl uh, during the Civil War. So, give him a great big hand. Thank you, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, something happened a while ago. I realize I have kin folk here tonight. <laughs> Ma'am, will you come up? <laughs> <laughs> this is my cousin. I never knew it until a while ago. <laughs> Don't start talking about family because it pops up. <laughs> All right, now I've embarrassed you, you can yes. get ready for what's coming. <laughs> when I graduated from East Carolina University in 1976, I went to work for the Congress for the United States General Accounting Office, which is the investigative arm, the investigative arm of Congress. And like so many people that moved to Washington, D.C., the first thing I started doing was researching my family tree. Archives was pretty close to where I worked. The Library of Congress, the DAR Library. And I had progressed pretty quickly in my research. I got to my great granddad <coughs> Thomas's generation. William David Thomas, born in the 1840s, should have been serving in the Civil War. And I could not find him in the Civil War records. I was looking in the Confederate War records. I came home and I went to see Aunt Nora near the Heritage House. She was up in years. So on that front porch with her, and I said, Aunt Nora, I said, uh, do you know if my great-granddaddy Thomas served in the Civil War? And like the old-timers do, and of course now I'm an old-timer, she goes, yeah, says, uh, we young'uns called him Old Pat. Said, 
Old Pat fought with the Yankees. And I'm like, uh-oh. The next breath, the next breath, and Nora goes, and old Pat was born out of wedlock. <laughs> and I put things together pretty quickly, but I worked for the Congress. <laughs> he was a bastard. He was a Yankee. What does that make me? So I was the great grandson. We're the great grandchildren of a bastard Yankee. You know? <laughs> and it was so important of a point to me that I uh, I made the preface of my book on the divided, divided leaders of the during the Civil War. Old Pat fought with the Yankees. <laughs> no Charles, speak up just a little bit more. What's that? Speak up just a little okay. bit more. Okay, all right. Uh, as I'm talking, if you have a question or make a point, raise your hand let me know. Because I want this to be interactive. I don't want to stand up here and be like uh, I said, the sociology professor in college, just preach, preach. So uh, please interact with me, and I will too. All right. I just want to point something to support what she was saying. What's that? On Goose Creek Island, Lowlands, and down the present historian is 90 years old, but his grandfather fought with my grandfather at Fort Fisher and they left the old book in the story. But they got caught by the Yankees and uh, his grandfather what his grandmother was expecting. So his grandfather wanted to get home. They said, if you join the Yankees, we give you uh, three weeks vacation. If you don't, we won't throw you in jail. Uh, so to so make a long story short, his his granddaddy's gravestone yeah, on Goose Garden is the only one that's a Yankee great uh, <laughs> Well, you, you make a good point. I won't get into the presentation, but my ancestors all lived and died in Berkeley County. Great granddaddy Thomas was dirt poor. His mother had to get support from the Berkeley County commissioners to live. He had nothing. He fought for the Union. He wrote his pension that when the Confederates came around to get him, he ran and went to Plymouth. I have another great granddaddy who died, whose father had a little bit of land. Had some horses. He served in Confederate cavalry. My third, the Hoggards, one of my friends, the Hoggards, he hid out. He didn't fight with anybody. His brother got <laughs> shot down by Confederate conscription officers at Elm Grove. Two of his brothers served in the Union. One of them died at Moorhead. My great granddaddy Thomas married a Kale. Her brother was at Plymouth, got captured, and died at Andersonville, Georgia. So my ancestry, it's hard to say you're pro Confederate, pro Union, whatever because Dave and I have talked about this and I've talked with a lot of people. It's hard for me, 165 years from it, to put yourself in their position. And the point you just made from Bertie County, the Confederates that got caught at Spotsylvania, Columbus, Gettysburg, or put at Point Lookout, they were given a choice by General Grant and Butler. Sign up and go out west and fight Indians or stay in this Point Lookout prison. What do you think they did? They signed up and went to fight the Indians on the frontier. And they were called galvanized Yankees. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of them at Plymouth, my answer, a lot of people in Berkeley that got caught at Plymouth, we'll get to it in my presentation, they had served in Confederacy and deserted and went over. Uh, that's, that's history. That's, it, it, as, we, as we said a while ago, it ain't just the North and the South. The blockade There's a lot more to it. And I'm glad you made that point. So thank you. All right, blockade, let's start. Uh, one more point I'd like to make for you. I've recently had cataracts removed for 50 something years. I wore glasses everywhere I went. Everything's blurred when I put them on, but I can't read this without them. So I don't mean to distract you, but uh, I got to see this. I want to see you. So Albemarle Sound topic has been very influential as. I'm nearly everyone here from Chowan County knows since the beginning of the Lost Colony. Uh, 1585, the English explored down this avenue, this thoroughfare. Show water is making the point. And they went a ways up the Chowan, and they went a ways up and on up. But my point is, Albemarle Sign has been important to the history of this region since the English and explorers first put foot on this area. During the Civil War, before the war, North Carolina was pro-Union. The people of North Carolina overall did not want to leave the Union. They wanted to stay in the United States. Albemarle Sound region, 
particularly my hometown in Burt T, was pro-union. They did not want to succeed from the United States. <coughs> April, in the election of November 186, when Lincoln was elected, the southern states below us began leaving. South Carolina left on December 20, 1860. January 61, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia leave. February 61, Louisiana, Texas, they go. April 12, 1861, at Charleston, South Carolina, they fired on Fort Sumter. The war began. North Carolina had not yet left the Union. We were still in the United States. Within days, President Lincoln called on the southern states and the northern states, I need 75,000 <coughs> troops to go down here in the south and put an end to this mess. And North Carolina Governor Ellis said, you're not going to get anybody from my state. He had not left the United States. He was not going to contribute to men to serve against these southern states. April, two days later, April 17th, Virginia left the Union. Now you've got Virginia gone, you've got South Carolina gone, and North Carolina's in the middle. Tennessee is not yet gone, but pretty much we're surrounded. You know, Robert, Robert E. Lee felt like North Carolina. He did not want to, like, he didn't want to have a civil war. But when they called him up and said, you will come serve the federal army against Virginia, he said, no. Can that fight my I, don't, I don't know when that happened. I'll, I'll get to when they started pulling troops out here, but they didn't have any union occupation, occupation here at that time. However, when they, well, I'll get to my presentation. When the union came, they started recruiting, but there's some points I want to build up to, to that. At that point in time, uh, I'm not aware that anybody was seeking uh, to recruit uh, against, uh, because Ellis said, I'm not sending anybody to fight against the South. And uh, it, was, it was all, my point is, Dr. Friesen is, Bert T. Chowan, nobody does anything on their own without somebody giving an order some board hire to, to do something. So. Yes, I said it wrong. The army drafted, it was going to draft Robert E. Lee and said, you come and fight for the Union. Well, the prescription, the Confederate prescription started in 1863. And by that time, in Bert T. County, they couldn't get anybody to enlist. Uh, the people in Bert T. would not enlist, and the people in Bert T. and maybe these other counties wrote to Jefferson Davis and Confederate Congress and said, don't even try to conscript in Bert T. County because they're going right over to Plymouth to join the Union. But a lot, I got to build up a lot to get to those points. So, um, okay. Uh, April 19th, two days uh, after Virginia leaves, Abraham Lincoln, as we learned in U.S. history, declared a blockade around the southern states. Except he did not include Virginia, which just left, and he did not include North Carolina, which had not left. That didn't last for long. Eight days after that, he declared a blockade all the way from Tumut River, where I live, all the way around Gulf of Mexico to all the southern states were to be blockaded. Nothing in, nothing out. What do you think that did to the people that had stood by the Union up at that point? Up southern. Didn't like it that now we're blockaded. Haven't left the Union yet, but we're blockaded. <clears throat> Arkansas left the Union on May 6th. North Carolina followed on May 20th. And then the last state, Tennessee, left in June. Pursuant to Lincoln's order to blockade the coast of the Confederacy, the United States Navy created the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. It had never existed before in the history of this country. But within weeks after Lincoln's declaration, they instituted a blockade, uh, <coughs> blockading squadron. Secretary of Navy Gideon Wells appointed Flag Officer Silas Strigham to command the block Atlantic Blockading Squadron. And his headquarters were at Hampton Roads here. Now, this first blockading squadron was responsible from Potomac River all the way down to the Keys 
and Florida, quite a bit, of, quite a ways. August, in the meantime, the Battle of Bull Run takes place. The Federal forces are run off the field by the Confederates. The North is embarrassed. At Yorktown, Virginia, just a ways above us, there was a set back there. The Confederates stood their own against Yankees. I don't use it in a derogatory term. <laughs> August 28 and 29, the first action of the North Atlantic blockade, of the Atlantic blockading squadron was right here at Hatteras Inn. North Carolina had put two forts there, Forts Hatteras and Clark. But you can put all the hardware you want, but you better put some men to defend it. When the Union Navy and Army shows up with a flotilla of gunboats, they overwhelm those two forts. They take Hatteras in a matter of two days. Now, North Carolina, one of the last states to leave the Union, is now one of the very first states to suffer a major defeat. And not only was it a major defeat, it opens up all this territory to the Union military. And nothing the Confederates can do about it, because they can come right in and go where they want to. A couple of days after Hatteras Falls, the commander of the blockade squadron, he resigned. And the Union military put a new uh, commander in charge, Admiral Goldsboro. On September, excuse me, on September 18th, the Navy Department reorganized the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Just way too much territory for one guy to control, command. So they divided it into the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Headquarters at Hampton Roads, which was controlling this coastline of Virginia and the coastline of North Carolina. The Southern Atlantic Blockading Squadron was headquartered out of Charleston. It took from the Cape Fear River down to Florida, and then the Gulf Blockading Squadron took the Gulf of Mexico to Texas. Long ago. We have, we have Hatteras, now we want Roanoke Island. What's important about Roanoke Island is one strategic location, one spot in the sounds of North Carolina controls three major waterways. That would be like Currituck, Albemarle, Pamlico. One spot. If, I can, if, if I'm a federal officer, if I control this, I, I've got all this control. Now we'll talk a little bit later. They're going to come get this right in Washington and New Bun. They're coming for that too. But right now, they're going right here and they go for Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island on February 7th and 8th, 1862. North Carolina hasn't been out of the Union in a year yet. The Union Navy and Army forces captured the island. Open action of what would be called Burnside's Expedition. Well, I, in my book, I think, they gave, I think they gave too much credit for Burnside because Burnside didn't go anywhere if he wasn't riding on Navy boats. <laughs> Goldsboro's Navy forces took him everywhere. So in here, I, and some other historians have called it Goldsboro and Burnside Expedition. But I prefer to give a little more credit to the Navy because they were very integral to what was going on in this region. Now, at Ronald Island. What kind of defense do we have there? We didn't have much at Hatteras. We didn't have a lot at Ronald Island. You had what we call a few good little gunboats, the Mosquito Fleet. They were so little and ineffective, they called them Mosquito Fleet. And you had some Confederate soldiers on some forts there. Just as had, had happened at Hatteras, two days, the Union Navy and Army and Figgis Landing, they take Ronald Island. Hot butter, hot, and I threw hot butter and marching through. Now, Admiral Lynch, who controlled, who was, I'd hate to have his job, but Admiral Lynch of the Confederacy, Confederate Navy, he takes his few little boats that can get away from Rock Island to keep him being wiped out there. He goes up to Marlboro and hits up here and goes up past Tanker and stops at Elizabeth City. Doesn't do him any good because Commander Flusser and all the gunboats come up from Roanoke Island after they've captured it and secured it, and they go get the Mosquito Fleet, and they take Elizabeth City. 
And again, no defense, nothing they can do. The Federals are overwhelming everybody running to, there's just no defense. Admiral Lynch's gunboat, I want to make this point because uh, to me it's important in the later interpretation of what we're going to talk about. Admiral Lynch's little seabird flagship, if you call it a, a gunboat, was rammed by Commander Fl uh, uh, Lieutenant Flusser's gunboat and sank. And Flusser took a surrender uh, there in Elizabeth City. Flusser, as we'll talk in a little bit, will later become the man that controls everything in the Albemarle region. He's going to be very influential to become an institution here in northeastern North Carolina. From this point on, from this point on in the war, from February 1862 until the end of the war, everything goes on during the war. Union forces control this waterway. Albemarle Sound is under complete domination of the federal military. There are gunboats going up and down this all the time. And there's nobody going to stop them because there's no assets, there's no Confederate assets here to, to attack these gunboats. So the occupation is early and it's continuing. February 12th, four days after Elizabeth City falls and the Mosquito Fleet is wiped out, four Union gunboats appeared where? Right out here. Four Union gunboats show up at Eaton Bay. Right out here. Right? We could probably just go there, there. We could probably see them today. I mean, this is early. They come into town. They land Marines land. And they had undisturbed possession of this town. And a few Confederate soldiers, probably a few militia from Chowan County, they flew. They left. Gone out to the countryside and get away. What they find here is no real Confederate assets. They destroyed one schooner, one small boat out in the bay, but they find eight cannons and they spiked them all. So there would be of no use in the future by the Confederate militia or the Chua County militia or any Confederate forces. I'll go back. While they were here, and this happened everywhere, happened everywhere. When Union forces showed up, Hatteras Island, Lisbeth City, Edenton, and later places, the population came to them. People came. We want to support the Union. We do not want part of this Confederacy. Now, is this like, hey, we have no choice? Or is it a continuation of the Union sentiment? I'm not a psychology guy. I can't read the minds of the particular that long ago. But I think it's both. I think they wanted to support the Union, but I think they also knew if they countered, if they countered these Union forces, they're going to pay a heavy price. So probably a little common sense, but probably a little bit of loyalty to the Union. Union Naval controlled Albemarle Sound. They allowed the military to go up these rivers and tributaries to conduct raids throughout the war. Now, they haven't set up a base up here, up, up at the top, but they're still operating out of Roanoke Island. Come, all our assets are coming in going out here, but they're patrolling going up and down. Uh, on February 18th, the people of this region are concerned. You've got the Union military, the Navy, Army, they're here, and the people are concerned. And on that day, Goldsboro and Burnside, the general in charge, issued a joint proclamation to the people of North Carolina that the mission of our joint expedition is not to invade any of your rights but to assert the authority of the United States and to close with you the desolate war brought upon you and your state by a comparatively few bad men. What they were saying was you've got to drug into this thing. Harnack Bell, I don't know if anybody over here knew him. I know Lucy probably did. He was my dad. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Holly Mag and I had some a lot of discussions. And I thought the world of him. He wrote a lot of articles in the paper. I was at the library one day when I was researching these books. And Holly Mack comes up and he made a point that was probably more visionary than I'll ever be. He said, Gerald, he said, uh, South Carolina got us in this mess. 
That, I, I think Holly Mack, I think you didn't believe it. I moved there, it was a mistake. What's that? I moved there, it was a mistake. <laughs> well, I never, I have never, I didn't put it in my book, I can't prove it. I can't. No. But, you know, it, it, it's, South Carolina was the first, they, they, they had to get out and others followed. And, and, and that was, Holly Mack made that point. <laughs> that, uh, Fire South injury. Carolina got us in this mess. <laughs> Well, he was a Virginian that fired the first cannon. But he was in South Carolina. Yeah, he was a Virginian. He was influenced. He, he, I don't know who fired the first cannon, but I know he was from South Carolina. <laughs> no, he had a plantation up on the James River. He yeah. was a hot guy. Yeah. And they, at the last of the war, when the Yankees finally got to that plantation, yeah. Yeah. you can imagine what they did to it because it cost them so much. Yeah. What happened on the same day, the same very day that Goldsboro and Burnside issues this public proclamation they want to read in all the little towns in Albemarle region of North Carolina. They send out another expedition from on the Island. They dispatched, dispatched another uh, <coughs> expedition on Albemarle Sound. Eight gunboats leave here, and where do they go? Right here to Eden Bay. They get here in the afternoon and they anchor. They spend the night out there. Nobody comes ashore. The next morning, they send one gunboat. Uh, and on board, the commander of the Army troops this time is the 9th New York Infantry, Colonel Rush Hawkins. He was a veteran already of all the actions that had gone on at Hatteras, Roanoke Island. I don't know what he did at Elizabeth City, but that was pretty much Navy. But the 9th New York Navy was on that gunboat, those gunboats. They stop at evening for the night. Next morning they go to they send one gunboat to Plymouth. They want to know what's going on in Plymouth. Gunboat goes up, he stays a while. At Plymouth, it's quiet. There's nothing going on. They don't find any Confederate assets. They don't find any boats being built. So this gunboat comes back and joins the fleet right here in Eden. And then they head out. Going to Cholon. Where they turn and start up Cholon. The people in Burke are very concerned now. Coal rain hasn't been visited yet. <laughs> So what did the people at Colerain do? Intelligence tell them these gunboats are coming, a bunch of them. They burnt the docks down at Colerain. <laughs> gunboats cruised right on by. <laughs> the gunboats were headed to Winton. Right about, oh, I guess, that's Bert T, right about up in here. Y'all know who Winton is. Anyway, the Union military, I'll make this point now, I'll make it later probably. The Union military was getting intelligence from the people of this region over and over and over. Flusser talked about his spies bringing him information. Every little ferry landing, every little plantation, he was getting information from the people of this area. He received information. And here's what I can't figure out. He received information that the people in Winton wanted to meet with Goldsboro and, and the military because they wanted to express their sentiments for the Union. Everybody else is doing it, why not us? Well, they steam up. As they're coming up to Winton, there's a black lady standing on the dock. I would assume she might have been an escaped slave or she was planted. She's out there waiting, trying to get their attention. The lead gunboat is the, is the flagship of Delaware. Colonel Rush Hawkins is up in the you, you, you uh, boat people know the trees, I guess you call it, the cross trees. Well, he's up there. Well, if, he's, if they're going up to that dock at Winton, Colonel Hawkins spots a battalion of Confederate infantry on the ridge. The 1st North Carolina Battalion, uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Williams, was, was hit up there. This woman was beckoning them in the rifle range. Hawkins comes down like a squirrel shot out of a tree. He said, got to go, back out, back out. Well, the infantry opens fire. Bop, 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 and they pepper that gunboat. Hit it 185 times, but no Union soldiers or sailors were hurt. The Union Navy and Army, they back down the river, get out of range, and they anchor for the night. And Goldsboro and uh, Hawkins confer. We're going back. Tomorrow morning, we're going back. They went back. And when they came in the range of Winton, they started shelling. And they opened up a grape shot and canister. In other words, heavy buckshot, and they went into town. The Confederates had flown. They were gone. The one time, the one time so far that Confederate forces confronted that flotilla of gunboats, they, they run. They, well, there had been a night What What did the Union military do? 
Whoever said burn it down, they burned it down. You're going to learn the hard way. If you abide by us, as they said on the day, the, the day before, as they said, we're not here to hurt you as long as you, I guess, behave. But they burnt, went into the ground. That, that sends a message to you. Come to us and you will pay a price. Now, I'm not a professional historian. I'm a researcher. That's the way I see it. That's the way I read it. If I've been the owner of some of those houses and went, I probably want to talk to that colonel. <laughs> Burned the courthouse too, and destroyed I think, I think all the courthouse. Yeah. Yeah. Went and paid a price. Even if Eden didn't pay a price, Plymouth didn't pay a price. This is the city, Hatteras, but we went up two forks, and but but went and paid the price. Nobody told me all this in North Carolina history. Just, <laughs> just, 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 all right. Uh, Okay, they go up to Winton. It's February, 18ish, 19ish. They come on back. They cruise on out. They don't stop anywhere. They go back to Ronald Island. They're gone. They don't come back for a while. However, other places suffer. March 14, Newton captured by the Union military, Navy, and Army. They're using joint forces all over the place. Gunboats, as I said earlier, are taking them, and they're taking town. Six days later, our friends in Washington, both the kind, just south of us, <coughs> captured. Same thing. March 21, Carolina City, captured. The next day, Moorhead City, captured by Union. March 25, both captured. In other words, they now got it. Not only they have Alvin Moore, they got this, 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 and they got this. And there's nowhere these boats to go. North Carolina ports are blockaded. What Lincoln wanted had been effectuated by the Union military in less than a year. Now, after all this, in two months since they've been up the river here, I guess the people get a little <coughs> relaxed. On April 29th, Commodore Vaughan, who's now in charge, ordered a naval force to make another show of force up the Albemarle Sound. Three gunboats. They leave Ronald Island, they go to Hertford first, they go to Edenton, and they go to Plymouth. They don't burn, they don't pillage, but they just show up. We ain't gone anywhere, we're still here. You remember, we're still here. And the sailors were ordered specifically to destroy any vessels they found at any of these towns and it didn't make any difference if it was a private schooner or a military militia boat or something that had a Confederate contract. Tear it to pieces and burn it. And tell the people that their safety depends on their neutrality and good conduct. In other words, let's play together here. Gunboats visited uh, Eden that night. That was the last time visited. The next morning, they went back to Roanoke Island. They didn't, they didn't land any troops. They made a point. Two weeks later, three gunboats under command of Lieutenant Flusser, who sank Flinch's command ship at the city, come up the Albemarle Sound. And in pre-dawn hours of May 14th, they ride into the Roanoke River, across the bay over here, across the Bachelor's Bay. And they went up to Plymouth. They stayed there a while. Union officials had received word that, and I'll make a point that other historians make all the time that I haven't made. An important avenue to lead to the armies in Virginia was the Wilmington, uh, the Wilmington Wealth Railroad. That bridge up here uh, near the Rapids, the railroad bridge, that could not be torn down because they had Lee, uh, well Lee wasn't in charge at that time, but the Confederacy needed to bring goods up from the south down that railroad. So we can't be having these Union military assets going up the river. Okay, Flosser has learned that the rebels in Windsor, my hometown, are running stuff up the Ch up the Rock River. Now, all you folks who live around here, how you go from Windsor to 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 Weldon? How you come down south from Windsor on the Catchout River and get to Weldon? The thoroughfare. <laughs> thoroughfare is, is north of Plymouth. They come down, go through the thoroughfare, and go right up 
well, we don't stop that, Flusher says. So he goes to Jamesville. He stops. The people on Jamesville say, hey, Luke, command the captain, Lafayette Thrower from Bertie County just went up the river about an hour ago into Alice. The Alice is a Windsor gunboat owned by the Caparts family in Windsor. Owned the Caparts. Bought, bought the Caparts. Owned the boat. Thrower was the family. So Flosser sends three of his gunboats after him. He stays back at Jamesville in his command vessel. Within a couple of minutes, he hears firing up the river. They, kept, they caught up with the Alice. Thrower has no choice but to do one thing. He ran that boat up into the swamp on the Bertie side. He sails out, and away he goes. And Flush and all of them get the gunboat. They bring it back, and they inspect it. In the gunboat, they found the bells, the iron bells from the Episcopal Church in Windsor were going to be sent to some place, some factory, to be turned into artillery for the Confederacy. Although Bertie County was strong union, there were still people that supported the Union. Now, I've said enough about what happened. What do you think Flush did after he finds out? He ain't been to Windsor yet, but what do you think he did after he finds out them folks were winning or sending metal to the uh, Confederates and some other supplies? Going up the Cashier River. <laughs> he goes to Windsor the very next day. They leave the four gun boats from here at Plymouth. They go up and they arrive late in the afternoon. And the people in Windsor in my hometown were shocked. Oh Lord, they already knew what had happened the day before, that that gunboat filled at Windsor. And Flusser, I guess out of kindness of his heart, didn't burn Windsor down. He went ashore and they inspected that town. And people cried, they begged in Windsor, don't burn us down. And he didn't, because he really found nothing else. He knew who was running the gunboat, he knew on this. He had the gunboat, he had what he had. They weren't going to use the Alice again because he had it. But he did not burn ones or down. But the four bronze cannon that came from the, from the bells in Edenton. Why didn't he burn Edenton? Well, the people in Edenton didn't, didn't count. They, didn't, they, didn't. They, had, they All their bells went to those four bronze cannon. Two of them are right down here. No, no, no. Well, I can't tell you why he didn't burn Edenton. I thought it must have been the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, them all. I, I, the records show that the, People cry in Windsor. I mean, oh, they spliced it out all the oldest women they had. <laughs> don't send them a militia. <laughs> they don't want to to send a militia. Maybe this union guy has a heart. The other thing about Flusser is he had two brothers. They were officers in the Confederacy. Oh. One of them died. And Flusser was as, as dedicated as much as I've read about him in research, and I wish I'd have written a book about him, Flusser had two brothers and the Confederate officers. And one of them I know died, maybe the other one did, maybe one of them got captured. I can't remember all the details, but he was the Union guy supporting the Union. But his brothers were out of Kentucky, I'm almost sure, out of Kentucky. But you can go check on the internet and you'll find out. But he, he's, he's defending the country while he's got two brothers. Divided allegiances. Brother against brother. Flusser, as I, as I interpret, and again, I'm not a historian, but I think he was a fair-handed man as long as you deal with But if you went behind him and tried to pull and try to get things done, <coughs> try to send stuff to the Confederacy, and he'd find out you were going to lose your warehouse. That night after they visited uh, Bert Tips late in the afternoon, as y'all of us know, I grew up on that river fishing. It's a narrow, crooked river. Uh, they backed down probably somewhere below the, what, present-day uh, uh, county farm, and they anchored in the swamps. In other words, nobody could get to them. There's no landings close by. They anchored that night, so nobody from Windsor, the militia, or anybody could go shoot at them. And then the next morning, they came on back to Plymouth. When he got back to Plymouth, he'd been using that base as a temporary headquarters. They made Plymouth the Army and Naval Headquarters for the Albemarle region. Plymouth is where it's all at the head of Now you got Made the military assets at Roanoke Island, and now you've got the headquarters for the Navy and Army in the area up here. <coughs> Albemarle Sound is controlled by the Union. Uh, Flusser was promoted 
Now he's now put in charge of, of Albemarle Sound region, all these gun boats. Sometimes there's four, sometimes there's five. They come and go. A lot of the information comes out of gunboat logs. The National Archives have the logs for these gunboats. Every every four hours, the commander of the watch on a gunboat was required to write in the log what happened. These things are, you can tell how the weather changed. The temperature, if a front came through, if a bad thunderstorm came up in the Chowan River, they, they had to take shelter. But they also say, we went to this place, we stopped in the swamp and picked up some slaves waving a white flag, we picked up some conscription refugees, people running away from the Confederacy and on. But these gunboat logs are just a history, of, a, a journal of what was going on in these waterways around here. And I, every time I identified a gunboat, I would, from the time I find it in the waterways, I would try to go through that log and take notes. This was before the internet and computers. It was all yellow tablets and taking notes. Yellow tablets and taking notes to remember what, you, what the information you found. But those logs are amazing. And I'll make this point now. You find out in a hurry who Flusser was after. He come in shore at a plantation and they would steal, not steal, they would take away. Because in the military it ain't stealing because they consider all the assets going to the Confederates if you weren't supporting the Union. But those folks, these I'll call them the rich plantation owners on Chowan River, and I'll part the way up Romo and pay the price. Because they were supporting the Union. John Poole, who ran for governor, had a big picture. He married into the, the, the rich Mebane family at, at Cape Hart's uh, church area. Owned a lot of land. He paid a price. He pulled in there. And they, they, in the springtime, they're catching the fish. And the Union Navy pull up and get all the fish. They take all the herds and shed. Take the slaves, too. However, there was one individual who owned land. I think he owned it on both sides of the river. Anybody in here a descendant of Augustus Hall before I say anything else? <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. But, but this, I mean, I know this, not everything's good about your ancestors, so go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am my father's daughter. My, my cousin's being quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could just sit back here like you uh, talk. Again, yes, I want it's, a, stuff. it's a perspective I have. And going through those gunboat logs, I noticed that they would go hit Pools Fishery, Etheridge at Colerain, Sutton's on Salmon Creek, Smith's, uh, Cape Parks. Cape Parks, the richest man in the county. I mean, he had to get slaves. And they, they start moving out of Burt T. They're getting away. They're going to Raleigh, Fugrave Arena. They're going to Georgia. They're getting the hell out of here. They're going to lose everything. Well, eventually, they probably are. Yeah, the South's going to lose it, but they don't know it at the time. I noticed in going through those gunboat logs, whatever gunboat pulled in, out of Augustus Hawley's place, didn't burn, didn't steal, didn't take anything. Am I wrong? Are you right? <laughs> Something's wrong here, folks. Everybody on that river are, li are, li are, are losing to the, to the Union, except Augustus Hawley. Now, Harry Lewis Thompson was the guy that got me into history. Uh, I wasted a lot of hours of my life because of Harry. <laughs> <laughs> but I went to Harry. I would always go to Harry. I said, where's the Widow Gaskin's place on the Chilwan River? That's where all the rebels are hanging out. And it was in them. Was Harry, Harry knew these things. Harry told me that it was well known that Augustus Holly sent his money and stuff to the north to avoid losing everything. That Augustus Holly knew that the South was not going to win that war. Now, I don't know if it's true. I heard that before, too. Heard? Okay. <laughs> But that's what Harry told me. It makes sense because every time they went, they got fodder, they got pigs, chickens. They were well provisioned, and they didn't burn anything, and they didn't take a slave. Now that's a little hypocritical, maybe, but uh, and that I mean, there has to be a reason. Y'all, it's your family, maybe you can use. <laughs> I wish I did know. I wish he was still here to ask me questions. I miss that. <laughs> It, it, it's very, it's very evident in the records I went through. Everybody else, I can't find another, I can't find another plantation that they didn't lose something. Yeah, <laughs> Daryl. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was told two things by Miss Elizabeth Van Moore about when the 
and ship's first came to Eagleton. Huh? A party came ashore looking for Judge Moore, and they picked up a young coloured boy and asked him if he knew where Judge Moore was, and he said yes. And we then led them around in the swamps for several hours because he belonged to Judge Moore and he liked his master. And the other thing she told me was that the uh, cannon that are now in front of the courthouse got moved to behind the courthouse so when the ships came, gunships came up they wouldn't think that they were about to be fired on. Yeah. I'm going to make a point. You just raised something. It's later on. I want to cover it. How many people here know about the Union garrison at Wingfield? in Chilwin County. The Buffaloes. <laughs> the notorious Buffaloes. They were Union. Yeah. But even Union hated them guys. <laughs> they, didn't they, they, they took over uh, uh, Dillard's, Dillard's plantation. Dillard was a rich plantation on the Dillard plantation. Right off, not high as coal rain, but it's right in here, and I've driven to it, and it's in shore off the Wingfield Road. Well, when, let me get to that point where, in, a, in May 62, <laughs> they make headquarters here. The Union military, the Army, gives these guys authority to recruit North Carolina Union regiments. They had given it when they captured Hatters, but nobody did anything. They didn't recruit anybody. When they got to Plymouth, Flusser, Commander Flusser said, we need to take these Southern people and put them in our military. They're coming to us. They will fight for us. And even if they don't fight, it's one more hand, one more rifle out of the Confederate Army. So Flusher pushed hard the Union military, and they began recruiting North Carolina Union regiments. I got a lot of information about them. And I was doing the research years ago. Now, the point, sir, you made, Chowan County. Plymouth raises a couple here. In Chowan County, they established one called at Wingfield, down at Dillard Plantation, and they put in charge a Confederate deserter. He wasn't even an officer in the Confederacy. He was a low-rent private. They put Jack Ferris in charge of this company of Buffaloes, Company E, 1st North Carolina Union Volunteers, and they were out of control. There was no discipline. The guys came and went when they wanted to. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that Byers was drunk, <coughs> took out a squad, and one of the boys from Bert T. Now, one of the boys from Bert T shot a drunk. One of the guys from Bert T County killed the commander of that company. Well, in the meantime, the Confederacy said, we got to get these guys out of Chowan. And they try to go across the Chowan River twice. And guess what happens? When they come ashore, there's a gunboat off from that Dillard's plantation. And they show bang, bang. Finally, the last time they tried, they got in all night, they came across on the news from Berkeley County, Murray Hill, they got across the river, and they run them out. And then the military, the Union moved that uh, that Union company out of there. Moved up, I think they moved them to Washington, what was that company? Good point, sir. Uh, Cameron County, Charlotte County also had guerrillas. It got really bad at the end of the war, which I hope to get to. But uh, Chris Beacons has written a book kind of like mine on Cho on, on, on uh, Elizabeth City and Pasquotank County. I don't know, I know the county. Pasquotank County. But he's got some good information. Uh, he wrote his, uh, I don't know if I'm believing him or not, but after I did mine, uh, this was published by the North Carolina Archives where Chris worked. He, kept, he told me, he said, Joe, I like what you did, so he kind of did one. So there's two studies on each side of Eden to, that have been done, and his is pretty much like mine. Gorillas, both sides, divided, you know, turmoil, paying a price, and so And I know you're going to get a copy of them in your library. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go quickly through these last. From this point on, that I've made, they raid all the time. They go, they patrol, and they're steadily picking up, they're steadily picking up whites, families, children, women, everybody fleeing, coming to Plymouth. Plymouth is getting overwhelmed. And in the meantime, they appoint, they appoint General Wessels in charge of the Army. So Wessels and Flusser are bookends. They coordinated on you. They were they, they worked together. They're like brothers. They knew each other so well. Now, your, your 
presenter next week is going to talk about the Ram album. I have my, uh, my thoughts about the Ram, how much it really did, but the gentleman next week is going to give you, a, I'm, I'm assuming, a pretty good history. 1862, this railroad bridge I talked about a while ago, the Confederates are concerned. So they hire a contract with Gilbert Elliott to build a, uh, build a uh, ironclad. Well, they contract with other ironclads across North Carolina, Noose River, Wilmington, etc. We're going to talk about this one first. 1862 contract, 1863. The war is turning against the South. Lee has, Lee has gotten beaten at Gettysburg. Vicksburg is falling on the same day or so. Uh, Grant's pushing Lee into Petersburg, and they're trying to build an ironclad gunboat up here to save the Confederacy. 1863 goes by. The Union military down here in Flushing, they know about it. They're getting, they're getting reports all the time in Berkeley County about what's going on up there. And they propose, we got to go up the river and burn that gunboat. Destroy it right now. They don't do it. Beast Butler is north of Hampton, uh, Hampton Rose, uh, Fort Monroe. I don't believe in the ironclad. Peck down in Newman wouldn't authorize. These guys here wanted 800 cavalry to land in Berkeley County march across, right across Bertie County on a surprise attack and burned that gunboat. And they didn't do it. They will pay a price for that. Oh, April 1864. Plymouth is full of Bertie boys, Washington boys, Chillon boys. They've all gone over there. It's been an easy life for those Army guys. Robert E. Lee and General Hope and Captain Cook and the gunboats getting close. They blockaded the river, but they didn't do a good enough job. That gunboat, that ram came down. Flosser had lashed his command ship in Miami to the south field, there at Plymouth, just south of the docks. When that gunboat came down the ram, it slammed into the south field, sent to the bottom of the Roman River. Flosser himself, the commander of the whole <laughs> Navy shooting match here in Albemarle is standing at the cannon on front of the Albemarle, I mean on the Miami. He wrote his sister two weeks before this. He said, when that ram shows up down here, within 15 minutes of our confrontation, I will be promoted to commander, or I'll be a dead man. I think he got away from him. You're probably better off than some young boy pull that rope. <laughs> Flosser pulled the cannon, Rebounded toward him all the pieces. Mm -hmm. He was dead. He was true. He was worried. He was dead. The gunboats pull out. They set up pickets. They had an album all sand. They haven't left. They've just pulled. What we got now is the Union captures Plymouth. The Army guys go to Andersville. A lot of the boys from Bertie died down there. These, these boys fighting with the uh, Union, a lot of them died down there. And it's a point to be made. Not all those names are on the Andersonville death rolls. They changed their names. Because they're going to be executed by the Confederates if they find out they were North Carolina, North Carolina fighting against the Confederates. You will find in the records, I find is I find one guy died twice in the Massachusetts military. <laughs> died in a battle in Virginia, and then he died at Andersonville. I wrote Andersonville because I sent him all these records I had of these people who were dying down there. And the guy said, yep. Says what happened was some dude, some some North Carolina boy, took the man's name. He was already on the rolls. He's dead. He won't come back. So he got captured on that Massachusetts soldier's name, and he died at Andersonville. So you got records when a guy dies twice. That's dedicated to the cause. <laughs> Didn't teach us this in basic history, did it? <laughs> All right. Okay. From the time they captured that gunboat, from the time. The Albemarle takes Plymouth. The Union wants it gone. They immediately start sending people up to Cash Out Middle River across that island and they're checking on that gunboat. May 5, Battle of Bachelor's Bay. Everybody knows about that one right here, right? There's eight or nine Union gunboats up here. Gun blue. They're not in the middle. Well, the Albemarle, Captain Cook brings it out. And they go to work out here in Baxter's Bay, all right out here, until almost dark, they battle. 
nobody wins the battle. One, two little, two little Confederate boats went back, one went back to Plymouth, and then captured other. I think the Omar disabled one of the Union gunboats, but nobody won the battle. The Albemarle goes back to Plymouth. This moment of glory was gone. It has captured a town, or helped capture a town, and it might have helped capture eight miles of river. It goes back. Two weeks later, Cook comes up again. These gunboats, these Union boats are waiting again. They're waiting. And Cook comes up to the mouth of the river. He looks out, I can see him now. Whoa, they're still there. Let's go back. They went back to Plymouth. And as far as I know, that was it. Never came again. October 61. Oh, I want to make one point. Two Navy sailors, there was four of them, went across that. They made torpedoes by the mines, swam the Roanoke River above Plymouth, and had these mines, these torpedoes towing, trying to slide them under the Alvin water, sinking it at the dock. And they got spotted at the last moment by Confederate pickets and shot at, and they had to give it up. And they swam back, and it wasn't sunk. They hired Cushion. He was a war hero in a lot of eyes. Goes to New York, gets a little picket boat, makes a torpedo on a spar, and they come back. And first night he tries it. And this is what I, I don't understand about the incompetence. At the wreck of the Southfield, they got Confederate pickets in the middle of the river. The river, the river ain't that wide. They got Confederates out there watching that river. The first night Cushion tries it, they spot him. Now he's got a picket boat outfitted with a quiet little steam engine with a tarp over it so it's quiet so you can't see the fires, the, 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 the wood burning or the coal. So he has to turn around and go back. He didn't, but he didn't give up. The next night he's going to do it again. The next night was dark, cloudy, rainy. I guess the Confederate pickets fell asleep. They let that picket that's going to sink that gun, that round, go right by him. And of course when he got there, this time they sank. Get into the bottom of the river. Immediately, immediately, Commander Malcolm is now to charge. He starts up the river the next day, I think two days later, going to Plymouth to take it back. He can't get by the south field, it's blockaded. He takes his float to it, he back out into Albemarle Sound. Now, where do you go? Where do you go? The river, you can go up river, or you can go down the river. Malcolm tells his boys, we're going to go up Middle River, we're going to go to that thoroughfare, and we're going to come down, and the Confederates haven't done anything to block the river above Plymouth. They were exposed. Just like Flusher was when the ram came down, the Union had blocked it, but the water was high and they got over it. Comes down, the flotilla, and they take Plymouth in a matter of hours. I mean, nine, eight, nine gunboats coming on top of those Confederates, firing great shot, and uh, a lot of heroes there on the, on the battle, but Plymouth was gone. Now, Plymouth is back under control. <coughs> Everything is like it was before April. So basically, the ram held a little piece of land for six months, and it was all gone again. Now, the war is starting to turn. Lee is bottled up. He ain't getting out of here. Grant's not going to let him get away. Flusser is now gone. The new commander, Macken, he's an old Navy guy. He's, he's tougher than Flusser. He starts running raids everywhere. He goes up the river past uh, Williamston, doesn't get to Fort Branch, but he goes up and gets Thomas Spell. Thomas Spell is a new uh, a Berkeley County rich plantation owner. He's got three sons in the Confederate Navy. They grab Spell. They take him. All right, we're going to take you. They said when Thomas Speller died, I mean, the war was over. He had so much Confederate money that he lit cigarettes. Cigars with his Confederate money but it was no good anymore. Then they started hitting these plantations on Salmon Creek, K Park, Sutton, Smith, Athens, Rule. Everybody go Holly. <laughs> Holly's going, <laughs> what are you going to do today? <laughs> but these plantation owners weren't here. The overseers were there. They're, they're gone. They've gone to their mansions around a few places in Reno, Georgia. They were gone. They left people in charge. And the slaves were running to them. 
All right. I'm going to get to the end. A point after control and dominate. April 9th, 65. Ladies pulled out of Petersburg and drenched on his tail. They get to the Appomattox and it's over. They don't need for any more southern boys to die. They surrenders on April 9th, Palm Sunday. At Plymouth, the Union commanders, word gets around pretty quick and telegram the other day. They knew it needed to be gone. That night, the next night, April 10th, they heard some of the most tremendous explosions up on the road they'd ever heard. And they had a hard time figuring it out. There was no Union assets, no Navy, no Army, no cavalry, no infantry operating up on the river. Two days later, Confederate deserters arrived at Plymouth. And guess what he told them? They blew up Fort Branch. You go now. Confederates blew up. And I think someone I had not probably a good historian on Fort Branch. I think they rolled the cannons and everything down into the river, so so. Sherman chasing Johnson in North Carolina, coming up from, from South Carolina, gets him at Durham. He surrenders before the end of the and they were, the war's over. It's done. Uh, May, the war's been over officially for a few weeks. These Union gunboats are still here. They make one more trip up the North River. They go all the way up to all these little shipyards where the Albemarle is built and all these places. And if they find anything that looked like it had been to help the Confederacy, they destroyed it. That was their last mission. It was after the war, but they made one more, one more raid. You know, you're not going to keep this stuff. If, if they find things up there, they destroy it. And by the end of May, the new Navy gunboats pulled out. They went back up north. A lot of them had been ferry boats uh, used, com uh, commercial boats. They were all deactivated and the mili new military pulled out, except reconstruction and occupation. The South is still not in the good graces. So at Plymouth, the Union military station regiments, one or two at a time, of United States colored troops. You don't think that ain't a change for you. Now you've got a, they're a police force in charge of this area. United States colored troops are in control. And keep your head down. And Bert T. Kine, this is an example. Harry Lewis Thompson and I talked about many times how these people from our county fight on both sides of the war and come back and live in that county afterwards. It wasn't like Missouri and Kansas. And I can't, I looked, I researched. I checked what I could. Harry did some research. I found one instant, they're all out there lost on the western Bertie side of the county. There was a, a freed slave lady she was in school. She was a teenager, a free slave, the year after the war ended. Her former master's children, who in the plantation system could have told that slave if she had been 90 years old what to do, told her to go do something. And the, the girls in school, she said, no, I'm not going to do it. Next, who shows up at school? The Bertie County Justice of the Peace. A man in charge of enforcing the laws with his redneck friends. And they drove that little girl out of that schoolhouse in front of the teachers, in front of the community, and took her in the woods and beat her probably worse than she'd ever been beaten as a slave. The justice of the peace. Well, something's got to be done. They tried in Bert T. Court. Were they convicted? Yeah, no. Yes or no? They were tried. Were they convicted? Oh. But somebody, somebody asked Bert T. forgot who was in charge over here. They sent troops over to get them. They got those guys. They brought them plumbers. And they tried them under military law. And them good old boys, I'll say it like it was, because what they did was wrong. Uh, they spent time in a federal prison for what they did. That was the only what I'd call atrocity, and obviously that was a personal thing. It wasn't a general society thing. It was wrong. It wasn't right. But that was the only thing Harry and I ever found, so obviously I didn't use that as one example because obviously I didn't 
you've got to have more than one every time. Folks, that's about as best I can do on the occupation of your major world away during the war. Any questions, comments? I'm totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a great grandson of Baxter. I appreciate y'all coming. I've enjoyed doing the research over the years. As I said to some people before I started talking, I'm doing World War II now. Every study I've done, whether it's Revolutionary War, there were divided agencies over there, there were people who wanted to stay with the king. They, the suffering they went through in the world of 1812, and World War One, World War Two. that's losing our parents' generation. <coughs> I did not realize until I started researching how many of the men that were influential in my life growing up, the Little League coaches, the police, the owner of the FCX, the owner of West Malta, all these people, these men, the farmers that gave me jobs to pull in tobacco, you could say they built me, they all had been in that war, I never knew. They didn't talk about it. So I think my point is, every time I do one of these little studies, I learn a lot. And I, I guess I gain appreciation for what our people have been through. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, is it known what the ships were that were sunk to block the Roanoke? The South Pole was the one that was, I don't know, uh, the records show the they original light ship was one of them. Yeah, they, they, they sank light ships, tugs, uh, and they put torpedoes and mines in the river. They, they tried to. They probably needed some beavers, I don't know. <laughs> but they tried to block it. What happened was, they thought they had it, and the records show that, obviously it's springtime around here, and in the mountains get a lot of water coming down and blowing up, y'all know that. And it, it was, the album all was able to float across. They sent uh, Gilbert Elliott went down and checked, and he signed it himself that night. He said, we can float across this. Uh, this article here, Master at Plymouth, this was done. Uh, between I and the Chief Civil War Historian in Raleigh, uh, Mr. Jordan, we talk a lot about what happened at Plymouth uh, up to the preparations. Uh, uh, I say this about <coughs> battle plans. Once the first bullets fired, the first cannons fired, battle plans go to hell. <coughs> I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in combat. I haven't. My son has. I mean, you, it ain't like a ball game where you plan to it's, it's reaction after that. But the Lord, of course, if you read some historian, the Lord sent a, a nice fresh water, fresh it, raised up. So that boat good on and get rid of the day and the <laughs> so, okay. Anyhow, if you're interested in, and we, we received a lot of very great comments across the country. This article was repeated a number of times in different books. Uh, and I, I, I take the most pride in this one, the Master at Plymouth, as, as I do my civil war. All right, folks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, you don't have to add too much. <laughs>